And Bayo Toby is in the studio. Good morning, Bayo. It's good to see you. Good morning, Kinsley. Good morning, Nigeria. All right, Bayo, good to see you. Thank you. That's right. Well, let's begin with the Daily Trust newspaper. Just below the masthead, we have experts suggest five cattle production systems for Nigeria. you find the details on page 21. Adeo Shun didn't need NYSC certificate to become minister. That's coming from the courts. Find details on page six. Concerns as polio variant hit 13 states. FCT. Nigeria could lose wild polio free status. That's coming from experts. Says COVID 19 insurgency worsen situation. And how wild polio virus differs from CVDPV2. And um, you see the picture story there, very sad incident that took place yesterday. is a scene of a fire incident at Kalmu Market in Abuja yesterday. Chibok girls, Chibok girl bags degree seven years after Boko Haram kidnapping. You have details on page seven. Kano youth sets self ablaze over inability to pay NECO fees. You find the details on page 28. Kano youth sets self ablaze over inability to pay NECO fees. Boko Haram fighters kill 18 in Adamawa. That's the all the details you find on page 10. Kinsley. Uh, all right, uh, Jumai, I'm just trying to... Um, Get across. Let's see the Punch newspaper, which is our next and uh, very busy front page. Above the main flag, we have the following headlines. Available power generation capacity plunges by 3,000 megawatts. That's according to Jenkos. INEC maintains dead governors, ministers, and others on voter register. That's page seven. Of course, those names, I imagine, will be pushed uh, eventually, uh, once since they are doing the uh, CVR now, the eventual upgrade. WHO assessing the NAFDAQ ahead vaccine production. That's according to a director. National Assembly ignores South governors and others, defense controversial PIB provisions. And then two earpieces there beside the nameplate. Uh, Buhari Army of Ministers yet to start Twitter ban uh, talks. Uh, it should be uh, Buhari Army of Ministers here to start Twitter ban talks. PDP senators and reps back Southern governors call Electoral Act Amendment subversion. This story says Lagos, Abia, Zamfara, 12 other states' debts jump to 1.68 trillion naira. Three writers of that headline. Yobe recorded highest increase of. Uh, that's almost 2,000 percent. You can see the figure there on the screen. Uh, Yobe recorded the highest increase of nearly 2,000 percent. Our debt to GDP ratio is still low, uh, that's according to Lagos, and states borrowing for consumption, say experts. Then the photographs you see on the front page there uh, from a simulation exercise on counter uh, terrorism. It took place yesterday in Abuja and it was conducted by security agencies. And below those photographs, 27 Kogi police students expelled for hiring exam mercenaries and other misconduct. NYC certificate, I'll take steps to redeem my reputation, says Adeoshun. Couple and AGF workers facing human trafficking charges get 10 million naira bail. Kaduna Baptist students abductors run out of food. NBC opposes ransom payment. Uh, that's the Nigerian Baptist Convention. Uh, highway robbers kill major and private in Jigawa. Boko Haram storms Adamawa community. 18 bodies recovered, many missing. Ayo. Thank you, Kinsley. Let's start with the update of all the Bethel uh, high school students that were kidnapped. The bandits who took away the students say they have no food to feed the 121 students. Uh, the papers are reporting that in a second contact with the management of the school, they demanded for rice, beans, oil, and other foodstuff. 
They say that they want the food store supplied before any negotiations at all. They say that the abductees will not be fed if the food stalls demanded are not supplied. Meanwhile, the president of the Nigerian Baptist Convention, Reverend Israel Akaji, says that the church will not encourage payment of ransom for the adoption of innocent children carried away from their school. He says, however, that the denomination have resorted to pray. They will pray to God for his intervention. We also got in touch with the parents and the Kaduna state government. And he says that Governor Nasser El Rufai says that they are working hard with security agencies to ensure their release. Meanwhile, Buku Haram is suspected to have attacked a, a village in the Prince of Sambisa Forest. The village is Dabna. Uh, persons who escaped from the attack said that the government came on motorcycles and started firing at persons, uh, anyone they could see in their, in their sight. The community uh, said they lost about 18 persons and they raised an alarm to the 23rd uh, Brigade, Armored Brigade in the area. But the sad, good news coming from all this crisis is that the last of the Chikmors girls who escaped Boko Haram activity in 2014 has now graduated uh, for the degree in accounting. Mary Katambi is the only one among the Chibo girls who remained in Nigeria since uh, uh, they came back that has stayed the course and has been able to graduate. After Mary was abducted on the 14th of April 2014, she and her counterpart escaped the Bora escaped at about 3 a.m. They eventually managed walking through the bush and eventually got back to Chibok. Uh, they are an inspiration to many young men, especially among the 2.2 million persons that have been displaced from the insurgency in uh, Borno State and other northeastern states, as well as the 100,000 that unfortunately have been killed. 300,000 persons have been displaced and are living in Niger uh, uh, from that. The, the other sad story which uh, Jumai read, a 20-year-old boy who had made attempts and sat for Neko three times and still was desirous to follow his studies but could not gather money to pay for his Neko exams has set himself ablaze. The boy used to work as a mechanic and gather money. So uh, he had hope when a politician in the locality promised that he would pay the exam fees of the students. Unfortunately, that was not fulfilled. So after closing from his mechanic job, the money he got, he bought petrol and set himself ablaze in the house. He was rescued and taken to a hospital. Unfortunately, after two days, he died. <clears throat> it's a very, very sad development, but um, I, 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 how I wish that government that sometimes come to help pay the school fees of indigent students had come to her rescue, a life would have been saved. There was this story that came up two days ago, and Kinsley, you were asking, what do they mean by uh, vaccine-derived polio? This is a new variant of polio that has now surfaced, and the report has it that it is now affected 13 states of the Federation and variant. And what is uh, vaccine-derived polio virus type 2? Uh, the experts say that this is a new virus that has come out. It's different from the wild polio that was eradicated from Nigeria. This time, it says that this virus is coming from those who are refusing to take the polio inoculation. The other ones, persons, are those who had not completed the total cause of the vaccination. Hence, the name vaccine-derived polio virus type 2. The, the technical is it, is name... It, I'm sorry, is it vaccine-derived or vaccine-deprived? Vaccine-derived polio Polio virus type two. That is the name. If you say the derived, technical name, mm. the technical name is uh, CVDPV2. You know, Bio. You, mm. you I mean, I remember you explained uh, when we were discussing that yes. Yes. Right? that yes. uh, this was a problem of maybe a dangling modifier, or otherwise. Uh, it said, look, is it vaccine derived? If it's vaccine derived, it means that the polio comes from it's vaccination. Now, if it is what you are explaining now, that it is those who have not uh, taken the vaccine or have not completed their doses, it means vaccine-deprived. So maybe the alphabet P is missing 
uh, from the headline. Uh, and, you know, probably that's what is persistent. Mm. So but we will, I'm sure that at some point we will get the uh, CEO of uh, the Primary Healthcare Development Agency, uh, Dr. Pfizer, so I, you know, to throw more light on mm. this. To say, is it vaccine deprived or vaccine derived? Well, the technical name from all the publications is vaccine derived poliovirus, uh, polio, poliovirus type 2. Okay, vaccine that's, derived. That's fine. So, mm. we'll, uh, if that's the technical name, uh, so be it. But there's a, a very uh, important story here, uh, which is on the NYSE certificate saga. Yes. Involving the then Minister of Finance, uh, Kemi Adeosho. Um, she had to uh, resign uh, from her uh, position in 2018. Yes. Uh, it, 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 I, I'm not quite sure what the 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 greater details are, apart from what has been reported. Mm. We also had a bit of it on uh, our bulletin uh, earlier, read by our colleague Tessie O'Mary. I've not read the full judgment, so uh, the comments are, are, I'm about to make are limited, of course, by uh, what, what has been reported. I'm not, the, the, the implications of, uh, of this decision are wide-ranging. And the Attorney General was the defendant in that suit, the Attorney General of the Federation. Yes. And it's almost inevitable that we haven't seen the end of the matter. Because on the one hand, it probably just tells you that uh, this, is pro this will sound the death knell of the NYSE scheme. Of the NYSE scheme. And as you very well know, there have been agitations in some quarters to say, look, do away with the NYSE. Why do we need the NYSE? Uh, and here, the, uh, the, his lordship has uh, heard that uh, you, you don't need an NYC certificate to hold a political office? No, uh, well, well, I don't know. What the, uh, her lordship said was that uh, Madame Fola Kemi Adioso, uh, who resigned her appointment, did not require to present her first degree certificate and NYC certificate to be appointed minister. Mm. And she also said at the point of her graduation, she was not a Nigerian citizen. She was a British citizen. So, well, I have, I, again, with the greatest respect to uh, his lordship, uh, that is also a disputable point. Mm. Uh, and, and I will tell you why. The, the, what was cited was the 1979 constitution that, as at the time, you know, she reached the qualification age for the NYSE. It was the 1979 constitution that was still in force, and that the operable constitution from 1999 is, of course, the Fourth Republic constitution as amended, and therefore she didn't require an NYSE certificate uh, to have been appointed a minister of the Federal Republic because, according to uh, his lordship, she wasn't a Nigerian citizen. How do you explain that? Now, th th again, that's a direct uh, uh, interpretation of uh, Chapter 3 of the 1999 Constitution, and it's going to raise a lot of, of, uh, of, of concern. Mm -hmm. Look at it this way. When the dual citizenship become part of uh, our constitution uh, uh, in, in this country. Yes. It was under the administration of General Ibrahim Babangida that that provision was introduced. All right? And then it then became part of other constitutional arrangements that we had until, of course, we then came to the Fourth Republic. Is it the case that the decrees that were passed by the Babangida administration were unlawful? If you have recourse again to what is popularly referred to as the Lacomis case, mm. that is to say the validity of decrees passed by military regimes. So if the, if the decree had amended the 1979 constitution, it meant that that constitution had been amended to the extent of the decrees passed by the military governments. So how old was she? I'm not saying this is not a personal issue with her, but how old was she at the time of that decree coming into force? Are you with me? So, and then, where did it then take effect on her? Because she was also a commissioner for finance in Ogun State. In Ogun State. Yes. And nobody forced her. I mean, she wasn't sacked as minister of finance. She quit. Mm -hmm. So, what, what, what then is the purpose of this declaration? To say that, you know, oh, you didn't need the NYC certificate. Any person can come from abroad and then you say, look, I don't need the NYC certificate. I can become a political appointee. If that is possible, why won't Nigerians who are resident in Nigeria also say, look, why did the, the NYC certificate? And then I can just get into service. Well, I think it, she, she followed it up through to, to clear her reputation. And she has gladly said that she feels vindicated. Mm -hmm. And she's, she specifically described the ruling, ruling as a vindication for many a Nigerian mm -hmm. who are in her position. Who, who are in diaspora and who want to serve their father. No, no, well, that's, that, vindi I, I, that vindication, I, I sorry, that, yes. what is the vindication? Kisley, the vindication is not time, whether yeah. you were not qualified 
to have served because you didn't have an NY certificate. It was the exemption certificate that was at issue. Yes. Indeed. I, I believe this topic will be discussed in the following days. In legal circles. Yes, in the legal circles. Mm -hmm. so well, thank you so much, Bayo, you. for coming this morning. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure as usual. We'll take a break right now. When we return, our conversation on the PIB bill will commence. Don't go away. You're welcome back. And as a prompt for our conversation here is Joseph Austin with a background report. After nearly two decades of failed attempts, the Senate passed the Petroleum Industry Bill, PIB. Main clauses in the bill include commercialization of Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation and the scrapping of the Petroleum Equalization Fund, as well as Petroleum Product Pricing Regulatory Agency. The industry is regulated substantially by the DPR, the Department of Petroleum Resources. Resources. What is going to happen now is that you're going to have the DPR functionally divided into two regulators, one for the upstream and then one for the midstream and the downstream sector. So if you're dealing with the upstream, you deal with the upstream regulatory authority. If you're dealing with the midstream and downstream, you deal with that regulatory okay. authority. It also okays 30% of profit accrued from oil and gas operations by the NMPC Limited for the exploration of oil in the Frontier Basin and allocated 3% profit from oil companies to host communities? Well, I don't know what is the final figure that will be agreed upon between the House of Representatives uh, and That's the Senate, right. but I know that there is a the provision there for something for the host yes, communities. communities. I think that will help a lot in making the host communities part of the entire process and program because if oil is being explored in your place and then basic amenities um, are not provided or are not present, um, basic opportunities are not available to the people, the, you can't take away that feeling of grievance. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives has also approved the bill and once the required concurrence is achieved, the bill will be on its way for presidential assent. How will the PIB impact on governance in the country? What role will regulatory bodies play in protecting production and well-being of Nigerians? Guests on Good Morning Nigeria will be providing answers soon. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, guests with us here in the studios, of course, who are very familiar with the Odyssey of the Petroleum Industry Bill. First, let's welcome Honorable Mohamed Tahir Mongunu, who is Chairman Ad Hoc Committee on the Petroleum Industry Bill of the House of Reps. And of course, uh, substantively, his Chief Whip of the House. At some point in his career, he was Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice in Borono State. Uh, Honorable Mongunu, delighted to have you this morning. It's a pleasure meeting you. Also here with us in the studios, we'd like to welcome Professor Yinka Morube, she's a research professor at the uh, Institute of uh, Advanced Legal Studies and President of uh, the Nigerian Association of Energy Economists. She's, of course, uh, also uh, a former uh, Commissioner for Justice and Attorney General of Edo State and had also served as uh, Legal Advisor and Company Secretary of the NNPC. Professor Yinka Mori, we're delighted to have you this morning. Thank you very much. Okay, now, uh, there's uh, a major advantage that we have here, the legislative crucible, of course, uh, I saw Mohamed uh, Mongunu participate extensively in all of this. He's a ranking member of the House of Reps. But we also have the privilege of the presence of Professor Yinka Moro in our, bag, uh, in our uh, banter just before we kicked off with the news segment of the program today. We talked about uh, the earlier steps that were taken before a bill was presented. We talked about OJIC, that is the Oil and Gas Implementation Committee set up by President Olusha Basinjo in year 2000. Now, Professor Yinka Morugbe was a member of that OJIC uh, that was set up in year 2000. So, uh, Professor Yinka Morugbe, tell us, here we are, 2021. That's uh, a little over two decades later. We have the PIB passed now by the two chambers, even though there are still some uh, discrepancies. What sentiments occur to you in this long odyssey? of uh, the, the attempts to restructure the governing instruments of our oil and gas industry? 
Well, um, frankly speaking, I, fir I think maybe the first uh, emotional, uh, or the, the, the first thing that went through my mind was, oh, at last, at last, something has passed. What has been passed is another matter, but something has passed. But then again, because of the journey and because um, I happen to know so much about the background terrain and different things happening, until the president has signed in the bill and it becomes an act, I will not actually rejoice. And I would just, I'm waiting to see the harmonized um, copy and then have that signed as a bill. But we've already at least moved to an extent. But we, we've been here before, actually. We've, we've been at this stage before. So w what happened in, in year 2000? And uh, there, that was the first OJIC. There was a subsequent OJIC. Just give us this background uh, as to how the bill came about uh, uh, and then the challenges that it then faced in the, in the legislature. Okay, um, well, it was realized a long time ago, in fact, in the 80s, it, 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 it became apparent that what we had as a legal framework for the oil and grass um, industry in Nigeria was not simply tenable and could not propel us into where we, as a nation, want to be. And so the government already started um, putting measures in place. So when President Obasanjo came in, he... Um, directed for the uh, establishment of different committees which were under the BPE at the time. The BP was a secretariat and the oil and gas sector implementation committee was one of them which was um, inaugurated in the year 2000 and was headed by Dr. Rilwanu Lukman. Um, and um, we were able to do quite a lot of work. We worked on policy areas. We did quite a lot but we didn't quite move as far as we would have wanted as regards the bill. A draft sort of came out around 2005, 2006. By that time, the minister was um, Dr. Edmund Dalkoru. So we worked on it. it didn't do, uh, we couldn't get too much done. And so we really stopped work around 2006. Then come the new administration with uh, President Umaru Yaradua, OGIC was established again. Dr. Lukman was brought in, even though at the time he was um, Secretary General of OPEC as well. He was brought in, he headed it, and I happened to be one of the few people, um, along with a, a couple of others, handful of other people, who were in the first OGIC and were in the second. And this time we were given very specific terms and asked to draft um, the petroleum industry bill. So I headed a legal and regulatory subcommittee. We had different meetings. It was very consultative. It was an interactive process. We discussed with different people. And we came out with the petroleum industry bill, which was given to the National Assembly in 2008, around the same time that Dr. Lukman became Minister of Petroleum Resources. And around that time, I was appointed into an NPC as the secretary to the corporation and legal advisor. And then we started the journey, which has been convoluted and has moved all over the place. <laughs> Indeed, a very long journey. Too long, too long <laughs> and winding. You know, the, two decades is a bit long to pass, you know, a bill, though it has gone through a lot of scrutiny. And um, I, I remember the Senate president saying that the bill is an indication that the demon that has sort of <laughs> behind the non passage of the bill has been defeated. Mm. Really? Well, that was his statement. Yeah, his opinion. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, Honorable Tan Mongono, you've been in the National Assembly now for, I think, more than 10 years, almost this, two this years. Is my, my yeah. Fifth term. Fifth term oh. in the National Assembly, <laughs> and you've been part and parcel of this bill coming on, going back, coming on. Why did it take so long for it to be passed? Yes, uh, I very much agree with the professor that this bill has suffered a very protracted and checkered history of postponements on the floor of the National Assembly. At a point in time, the bill came as an executive bill. Subsequently, at a point, it came as private member's bill and what have you. Well, to cut the story short, the reason why 
the National Assembly succeeded in passing the bill today is as a result of the engagement up initial with the executive even before the bill, the bill is brought to the floor of the House, of the National Assembly. That is the engagement between the executive and the legislature to understand each other as to the contents of the bill. And even after the bill has been formally brought to the National Assembly, there is constant engagement between the legislature and the executive that brought about to the present position that we are in, which culminated in the fact that the bill saw the light of the day. So it's a matter of uh, constant engagement, not only between the executive and the legislature, but also the generality of Nigerians and also the st stakeholders in the industry. Because we took time to visit the host communities we took our time to visit and access the state of our refineries. And then series of retreats were also organized with a view to broadening the horizon of members on the nitty gritty of the bill. Because it is a highly uh, technical bill that members need to be enlightened, their horizon need to be broadened. So all these factors culminated in the passage of the bill to the door with some uh, differences between the Senate and the executive. So I will attribute it to consultation between the executive and the legislature, and then the new uh, atmosphere of understanding and co co uh, camaraderie between the executive and the legislature, as well as also the engagement of Nigerians, particularly uh, members of the host communities and generality of Nigerian stakeholders that culminated in this uh, uh, result that we saw. Okay, Professor Inka Morabai says, good to think that uh, the bill has been passed, but that until the president gives his accent, uh, you know, she, she, she would be reserved in uh, giving full plaudits to uh, the new dawn in the uh, legal framework governing the uh, oil and gas industry. But right now, uh, even with the passage in the respective chambers, there are uh, differences. Uh, the most popular, of course, is the percentage to be allocated to the host communities. House says 5%, Senate says 3%. What are the other areas you may wish to uh, speak to? I know that there is already a conference committee. Yes, uh, already a compress committee <coughs> has been set up, as you rightly pointed out. The House approved 5% of the operating cost of oil companies to be given to the host uh, communities with a clear governance structure for the administration of these this funds as to what percentage goes to recurrent expenditure, what percentage goes to the capital expenditure. And then the total amount of money, if it is the 5%, is about $875 million per annum. And then the 3% proposed by, by the Senate is about $305 million per annum. So these are the differences between the two houses. A, harmo uh, a harmonization committee has been set up. Uh, then it is a question of give and take. The House will go with its own position, <coughs> while the Senate will come with its own position. And then apart from that, the other area of difference is that uh, the Petroleum Equalization Fund was retained by the House while the Senate did not retain the Petroleum Equalization Fund. The Petroleum Equalization Fund was retained by the House. And the, the reasoning behind the retention of the Petroleum Equalization Fund is, well, we are all uh, 
are aware and then fully see of the fact that in a deregulated industry which the bill seeks to achieve uh, equalization will have no place. But what the House seeks to do is to provide for a transitional arrangement, not to retain it permanently, but for a transitional arrangement, transitional provisions so that it will bring about an orderly phasing out of uh, the petroleum equalization fund because the sudden exit is going to bring a lot of uh, imbalances uh, in, in the sector. Uh, that is also one area of differences that the House and the Senate they will have to sit down and harmonize. Substantially, these are the, the two areas of uh, differences between the Senate and the House for which there is need for harmonization before the bill is eventually sent to Mr. President for assent. Mm. Professor Inka, this journey has been bumpy, mm. very, very bumpy. Mm. And um, uh, Honorable Mongone is saying that the synergy between the legislation and the executive sort of made it possible for this bill to be passed. It's a historic effect to be mm -hmm. achieved in mm -hmm. Nigeria. How much did it take away from you going through all these years, you know, these bills, one year after the other, and um, the areas that have been addressed, like Kinsley said, the percentage, you know, environmental degradation in those areas, you know, and um, the feelers coming from all the media platforms and everything we've been hearing since the PIB bill was passed is that there's a rumble in the barn. Where does that take us? Where does it take us? Where are we now? Um, it really depends. Like I say, we've passed a bill. That's or we are on the verge of passing a bill and getting it to uh, become an act. That's something maybe. But I like, like I say, we've been here before. Now, why are there the rumblings? One, there are the rumblings over the different um, percentages. You've mentioned one of them. I guess you will mention the second at a point in, in time. There are also rumblings because right now the bill is not... Um, what has happened is change is a constant, as I always like to say, and the world has been changing. But we have not kept up with that pace as regards our legislation. So we now have this petroleum industry bill that has created a lovely framework. It's a shame that some of these other issues are clouding some of the really great work there as regards creating a proper framework for the administration of the uh, industry, for me particularly in the upstream. But in the meantime, so much has happened. There's so much happening in the energy industry. There's so much happening as regards environment and climate change. And the bill really hasn't taken into cognizance a lot of this. So what we have is a dated bill, unfortunately. But because there's been this synergy, which I have to say we didn't have in the beginning in the same way, we did not have that um, close relationship. But I think that the people drafting learned from experience. Definitely one of the major people that is behind the success of this um, bill was instrumental, very much a part of us in the second OGIC. And he knew one flaw was that we did not flow as much with the National <coughs> Assembly as we should have. So I'm optimistic. My nature, though, is optimistic. I'm optimistic that we will be able to amend those things that are not possible. But whether those elephants in the room the percentages will allow the passage of a bill is another thing. And I really hope that the, harmonize, the committee that harmonizes takes into consideration some of the realities of Nigeria and the fact that there are still many, many interests outside that um, have the capacity, you know, with people who have the capacity to do all sorts of things. Okay. Well, in a sense, uh, Honorable, mm -hmm. I mean, shall we say that from your explanation, that from what we now know, that... Uh, the label often attached to the Ninth Assembly of being a rubber stamp, according to those who say mm -hmm. so, has actually now yielded beneficial results mm -hmm. on account of the mutual relationship rather than mutual antagonism <laughs> between the National Assembly and the executive branch. Well, uh, one thing that uh, Nigerians should know or should come to terms with is that both the executive and legislature were elected by Nigerians in order to give them good governance 
and deliver dividends of democracy to their doorsteps. The fact that uh, the executive derives its power under Section 5 to execute laws or for the implementation of laws and then Section 4 for the legislature to make laws does not mean that uh, there is an antagonistic relationship, but it's supposed to be a relationship that is supposed to be beneficial to Nigeria and mutually beneficial relationships that would translate into good governance to Nigerians. So people are looking at it from the angle of an, a legislature being antagonistic or being confrontational. No, that is not the case. So the, in, the, there is no way the National Assembly will reduce itself to be a rubber stamp of the legislature. <clears throat> When it comes to issues of defending the interests of Nigerians, I assure you, wherever the executive is going astray, the legislature, as it is presently constituted, will jealously guard and protect its powers as enshrined in the, in the, in the, in the Constitution. And then when you look at the nitty-gritty of the bill, it's not everything that was brought to the National Assembly by the executive was swallowing hook, net, and sinker by the, by the, by the legislature. There are, there are about 45 amendments, major amendments, in the bill that were brought to the National Assembly for which the National Assembly has made an, 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 an amendments to. Okay. And then typical example is the 2.5% was proposed by the executive. The Senate jacked it off to 3% while the House, in its wisdom, get 5% for which it's awaiting harmonization. Oh. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I know, the, um, what, um, Professor, they say the need to address investment and return to the oil industry due to uncertain investment climate, like we witnessed in 2020, you know, with the COVID-19 insecurity. They say that is the reason why the bill came into place in the first place. So how will it address this declining investment and uncertain climates out there? Okay, first I have to say that uncertain investments and um, a, a suitable investment climate cannot come from one bill. It comes from the totality of what pertains within a country. But where you do have a good framework, I mean a lot of people, a lot of companies were freezing because they didn't know what was going to happen in Nigeria. And there were changes in the world that Nigeria wasn't taking into cognizance. I mean, if you are saying a legislative framework was outdated in the 90s, what can it be like in 2021? So there were urgent things that needed to be done. And so the bill definitely tries to address this through a governance framework that provides for established procedures that tries to cancel out and remove bottlenecks in the system that make things not so amenable and by dealing with the fiscal framework. Now the jury is out on the fiscal framework and I know that there are still discussions with the different uh, companies. So how good it is or how good it is or how bad it is will really depend on what the actual practitioners say. The extent to which it has taken into account the needs of the indigenous producers because they are incredibly important for us. The extent to which that has been done also really needs to be seen and I have no doubt that within the next few weeks um, there will be, well, well there should be comments or there should be moves by some of the different groups talking about whether or not their interests have been served or not because uh, I think one thing we need to note as well in Nigeria, there's a lot of euphoria about pass, passing a law but passing a law is not change. It is something that is allowing for change. So we still have to talk about all the next steps. But the good thing is at least we have something in place. The challenge is for it to be what we need. Well, I, I like that uh, jurisprudential uh, perspective. That passing a law isn't change, no. but that uh, it is a passage that allows for the steps for mm -hmm. change uh, to, to take place. So we'll, we'll come to all of that. But uh, let, let's uh, compartmentalize aspects of the bill. Uh, it was always a helpful framework. 
when they had when the legislature had four uh, parts, mm. uh, four different bills in the past. But uh, of course, here we are now. We know that the usual upstream, midstream, and downstream. Mm. Uh, from your perspective, what uh, is likely to change now in the upstream sector that seemed antiquated in the past? What is likely to change in the upstream that, well, I believe that the regulation will be clearer. I think that there are certain processes that will be clearer. Bidding processes will be much clearer. There is a grid system, grid system. So the, the, um, the way in which allocations are done will be made much clearer. The role of the minister, I don't see as changing so much de facto. There had been... Ideally, a minister is really supposed to be in charge of policy and not, uh, he's not supposed to be the final arbiter and the one that takes final decisions that have to do with regulation or technical issues. Somehow, he still retains a little bit of that. So we do have some clarity and certainty. We have um, gas covered. That's a huge issue because we basically had an unregulated gas uh, sector. We have... Um, the downstream covered. You know, one of the huge problems of the downstream is that it has not been regulated at all. So these are great uh, improvements that will help. But at the end of the day, the totality of what is happening in a country makes a very big difference. And unfortunately, we have had slowed down um, investments. The challenge is for us to get it up now that there's so many, there, there's so much happening in all the countries of the world. I mean, oil is being discovered everywhere. And at the same time, we're moving towards a net zero uh, carbon future, um, future by, in, the, in, the, in a few decades. Maybe not by 2050, really, but we're definitely moving in that direction. What, what, what are some of the uh, issues that our audience uh, should know with regard to Upstream. I, I recall that in the past you will be hearing matters related to signature bonuses, allocation of oil blocks to individuals. You will be hearing about cash costs. I mean, although that has been less so uh, in, in recent years. Uh, what were those things that were disincentives to, say, the IOCs, even indigenous companies, in seeking to invest uh, in the upstream that have now been? Uh, clarified in the two versions passed by the two chambers of the National Assembly? Okay, I haven't seen one version at all, and I have seen one. And uh, I have seen one which I think is the Senate to an extent. And I hesitate to actually talk about actual precise provisions. In fact, the one, one precise provision that I am particularly looking at is definitions okay. of different things, because I think that makes a different but what a difference but what I'm saying is that the process for allocation of acreage has been that is the bidding process and all has been clarified to a great extent. The primary problem that we have had in Nigeria is the capacity for a few individuals to unduly influence processes because there is um, not enough governance and the bill has tried to do without that by providing for many things there. That's why I say implementation is very key. That, that is a major thing. The bill has also tried to provide for complete regulation. As it is now, we've t we have emphasized technical regulation at the expense of commercial regulation. The bill now has ensured that there is technical regulation and commercial regulation for all the sectors of the petroleum economy. So that has helped. The bill has done something that has never happened in the past. That is, refer to host communities and talk about community funds and community development that has never done, been done in, in the past. It has totally overhauled the fiscals. Our fiscals were really, really outdated. And that is very significant. So if you look at the bill, you'll see that there have been many significant um, movements. Obviously, there are people with different opinions. There are some things one person might like, another person might not like. But I believe so much in the bill is workable. 
if one wants to move forward. Indeed. Honorable Dan Mongono, she has, uh, you know, Kinsley itemized some of the, you know, bills that were, you know, segmented. And, um, but there's so much priority placed on the industry governor's bill, that's PIGB. Does that, is that an indication technically that the sector will foster a much more better national development for all? Yes. Governance is uh, very key because it brings about transparency. Because NNFC as it is presently constituted is not transparent it's in its modus operandi. Everything that NNFC is doing is shrouded in secrecy. And the more you try to understand the operations of the NNFC, the less you understand. And that is why the bills decided to unbundle NNPC, make NNPC a karma company that is going to be privatized. In the beginning, it is the, uh, the Federal Ministry of Finance Incorporated and then the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Incorporated will hold the shares on behalf of the Federation in NNPC before other shareholders are uh, there will be public uh, offering of the shares of NNPC so that uh, it will be run purely as a company that will bring about the much needed dividends to, to, to Nigerians. And it's, 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 it's also in tandem with international uh, best uh, practice like in Saudi Aramco and, and, and what have you. And then there is also, with regard to the governance issues, the bill seeks to create a commission that will be saddled with the responsibility of regulation rather than having uh, one body acting both as a regulator and as an operator. It will bring about conflict of uh, interest. Then we have the authority that will be responsible for the administration of the sector and what have you, while the commission will be charged with the responsibility of uh, regulation, then the NNPC will be run purely as a common company that uh, will be governed by the companies and allied matters the, uh, act in its operations, and then it will bring about dividends uh, to, to Nigeria. And then the downstream uh, sector, the upstream sector, and what authorities that you have, you have mentioned, all these things were unbundled with a, bring, with a view to bringing about transparent uh, governance in the industry so that once it is transparent, uh, it will bring about the much needed uh, investment. It will attract uh, much needed investment to the sector, especially against the backdrop of the fact that we have at least maybe less than 20 years for us to maximize, exploit our uh, fossil uh, fuel resources that we have before the world moves away to uh, renewables. Honorable uh, Mogono, thank you. I, I, I would let uh, Professor uh, Aborobe also come in here. W what do we know about the unbundling of the NNPC in the bill as passed? I, I, when I hear the word unbundling, I, I'm just wondering uh, because, yes, the NNPC is a behemoth as it were, but over the years since the original creation of NNPC in 1977, we have seen a number of subsidiary entities emerge from the NNPC. Uh, I mean, NGC is there, NPDC is there, you, you have IDSL, you have the refineries, then they became uh, corporate entities on their own. So when we say now that, uh, in the manner of speaking, that NNPC has been unbundled, uh, what, what, what is it that you are reading into this? Well, to an extent, the unbundling of NNPC has already commenced in a sense because if, it, it depends on what you define anyway as unbundling. You are talking about NNPC, the corporate, really being a holding company and being the one with these different um, subsidiaries. And this is now even already reflected in the fact that they talk more in terms of chief operating officers. There are terms that are being used that are more corporate. So there is some stuff being done even without the bill itself being passed. I think the primary thing is the creation of an NNPC limited mm -hmm. as a company as opposed to a public 
cooperation. I think that is what is significant. And um, the fact that that cooperation is going to be, is expected to be one that will be operating in alignment with commercial principles and actually making profit unlike now, whereby by the time you add up everything, you do find, yes, there are some really, really profit-making entities um, that are subsidiaries of NNPC, such as NPDC, but that there are many other cost centers. It's hoped that that will not be so. So that, I think, is what is so, uh, significant, and the fact that we are hoping that NNPC will gravitate towards being a public, um, publicly owned corporation with shares owned by individuals and other entities, like um, the Honorable has said, this is something that's happening all over the world. We're actually following something that has um, been in existence for some time. So technically it means that every Nigeria will have a stick. Uh, you, well, every Nigerian is expected to be a stakeholder definitely in one's oil resources, but let's see who the shareholders um, end up being in the, you know, at, the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, as a corporate organization, you have certain responsibilities. And for that reason, there will be, I mean, Nigerians will be able to do a lot of things and we are active people will be able to ask for and demand for certain things. For accountability. Ask for, yes, yeah. accountability and disclosure. So from a governance perspective, it's actually quite significant. Uh, Honorable Moguno, please uh, speak to this issue further. The NNPC as a limited liability company, yes. uh, which is in a sense a private company, yes. and then NNPC as a public limited uh, uh, company, mm -hmm. and transitioning from uh, its current statutory uh, corporation uh, status. Why did the legislature adopt this approach of uh, first making it uh, a limited company, limited liability company, uh, rather than uh, opting uh, to, well, since it's already a pre-existing entity, uh, take it straight away to the uh, stock market so that, you know, institutional investors, individual uh, shareholders such as Juma is asking, uh, could purchase uh, shares immediately and then we'll begin to ask questions at AGMs. <laughs> well, you know, for now, there are a lot of toxic assets of NNPC. So there is a need in the interim as a transitional arrangement for the Federal Minister of Finance Incorporated and then the Federal Minister of uh, Petroleum Incorporated to be the shareholders in consonance with the companies and allied matters decree that requires at least two shareholders for the purpose of uh, incorporation of, of a company. So as a transitional arrangement and have regard to the huge toxic assets of the company, all these things needs to be sorted out before it goes public. Because once these things are not sorted out with regard to the toxic, toxicity, toxicity of the NNPC, and what have you, by the time you even go for public, nobody will, will come. So as a transitional arrangement, these two entities, that is the Federal Ministry of Finance Incorporated and the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Incorporated, will be the two shareholders as on behalf of the Federation before it goes public so that it will be a, just a transitional arrangement. You, you know, some persons who have commented on the passage of the bill with regard to what you have explained say, mm -hmm. look, instead of uh, getting the Minister of Finance, Inc. Uh, as a shareholder and Minister of Petroleum Resources as a shareholder, why don't you take the NNPC Limited to the Sovereign Investment Authority? I'm sure you must have heard this argument. Yes, we, are, we, have, we have had that argument in the course of... Uh, of our public hearing, and even some of our colleagues are fiercely of the opinion that uh, it should be the uh, sovereign investment, national sovereign investment uh, that should be the, because it's, it's a federation agency. And then NNPC is also like a federation entity. And then the sovereign wealth uh, investment for is a federation entity. While Federal Minister of Finance Incorporated and then the Federal Ministry of uh, Petroleum Incorporated are federal government uh, agencies. 
But you know, as I said earlier, this is purely a, a transitional arrangement that subsequently it, it will metamorphose into, into what, what you said. But the Federal Ministry of Finance Incorporated and the Federal Ministry of Petroleum are holding this in trust, in trust on behalf of the Federation for now. Okay. Because if you, you go to the definition section of the, of the law, it is clearly stated that they are holding it in trust on behalf of the, of the Federation. Mm. So that, that is to say that the Federation is the, in law, that is the Federation is the beneficiary. The Federation that, is the beneficiary. That, that we temporarily addresses yes, uh, the, uh, the uh, agitation to say, look, why don't you take it to the Sovereign Wealth uh, Investment yeah. Authority, the first yeah. instance. Yeah. There's a point that has also been made. I wouldn't know whether this is also in the definition session. Uh, it relates to regulation of, of, of the industry. Uh, Honorable Mugunu was talking about commission and then authority. Well, where are we coming from? Where we are coming from, to the best of my understanding, is that we had an industry regulator known as DPR. DPR is in existence. Okay. Uh, but persons often argued that uh, DPR could seek to regulate all other players but NNPC. Uh, and so <laughs> NNPC, of course, uh, seemed to be above uh, the regulation by DPR. So what does the new bill provide in, in terms of regulation? And is the regulator now truly independent, uh, say, of the Ministry of Petroleum Resources? Yeah, and um, the, the bill provides for an independent regulator. I have to say that the problems of DPR aren't about... Uh, the problems of DPR, frankly speaking, center around being empowered. A regulator has to have resources, monetary resources and all the resources that it needs. It, does not, it cannot be dependent on, um, and it can't be dependent on the people it's regulating, the entities it is regulating. The problem of DPR has arisen from the fact that it has had no law. And that is why DPR has always been a champion of the petroleum industry bill. It should have been the Petroleum Inspectorate, and that is, again, without going into too much detail, that's really the problem why the uh, industry has been rocky. We had an NNPC Act, in fact, have an NNPC Act that talks about NNPC and the Petroleum Inspectorate. And the Petroleum Inspectorate is what was carved out of NNPC, so to speak, and made a department in a ministry. So a department within a ministry can hardly regulate the Nigerian National Petroleum um, corpora uh, Corporation. That's really the truth of the fact, especially when it's hampered. It should be really, really made functional. So for the DPR, which I believe is the one entity that will transit into the upstream regulatory commission, it's a major victory. A regulator must have laws back in it and must have the power to enforce whatever it is that it is, um, it is doing. So that has really been the primary problem. Now it should, if you have somebody that knows their laws, the head of the uh, commission should be able to regulate anyone that is working, any entity that is working within its area. It's hoped that NNPC will no longer be that super mega body that embodies, basically regulates the industry talks on policy and re works in co the commercial area. One of the major aims of the reform was to separate these functions, the technical functions, the commercial functions, and the policy functions, and put them in different entities, purpose-built entities. Yeah, I, I, you earlier talked about, uh, Juma, you remember Prof was talking yeah. earlier about technical regulation versus commercial regulation. Oh. Could you explain that uh, to our viewers? That, so what, what has the bill achieved now? with regard to this too? Okay, so um, the DPR came out mainly as a technical regulator. So it was, um, it was the one that would give the different criteria as regards the wells, as regards exploration, development, basically all that you have to do when you're in the business of oil exploration and development. And it was concentrated in the upstream. And the upstream is the area where people are actually getting the oil out of the ground. It didn't deal with the commercial issues that had to do with pricing and sales, etc. It didn't regulate that area. So there was a bit of a vacuum. So now it regulates the upstream as a whole. 
the technical matters and the commercial matters that have to do with buying and selling and the trade of um, oil. And then we have another entity that's doing the same at, in the other areas of um, the industry. That's the midstream and the downstream. That's everything that has to do with processing the oil all the way to getting it down to the consumer. Okay, you talked about getting the oil, you know, out of the ground. Let's talk about the exploration and development of the frontal basins. Frontier basins. Yes, which is, you know, in order to take advantage of the shift from fossil fuel to, uh, you know, renewable energy. It will take a lot of funding. Where's the money going to come from? Well, um, the bill says that it will come primarily from NNPC and... Um, Apparently, a percentage has been set aside, and that is a huge problem. First of all, and I, I will talk strictly speaking without taking out anything, practically speaking, you are dead as a country, an oil-producing country, if you cannot have exploration. You must have new discoveries, otherwise your industry will dry up. Now we're talking about net zero by 2050. If you read some of the documents, and I'll encourage people to go and read the IEA report on the roadmap to 2050, you'll see that a lot has to be done to achieve net zero. But net zero doesn't mean no carbon. It basically means trying to keep our emissions, global warming, at 2% or, you know, ideally 1.5 if they can. A lot has to be done. The truth is that... Um, Hydrocarbons will still be around, but when you have a figure like that, you know that you have to try to get as much as you can from your hydrocarbons in a sustainable fashion. So it's good to be able to explore. The problem is where you explore, and the problem is the perception right now as to what a frontier basin is. But looking at the bill, and I think that's the primary reason, I, I actually brought my phone to make sure because it's so contentious. If you look at the bill, um, you are going to see that the frontier basin is defined in such a way that you can do what you want with it. Because it says frontier acreages means any or all acreages in an area or land in Nigeria defined as a frontier in a regulation issued by the commission. And frontier basin means basins defined as frontier in a regulation issued by the commission. The regulation, there will be a regulation and there will be something that talks about the frontier and frontier basins. They don't all have to be located in a particular part of the country. No. In fact, right now, geologically speaking, they aren't all in a particular part. There are some that are there. I mean, for example, the north. My colleagues, a uh, particular colleague would also tell me that, in fact, when you're talking about Benue, Nur there is oil. Mm -hmm. So they always said there was some oil, and there's oil in desert areas, but, you know. But So if there are many nuances. I think that we don't necessarily need to jump to conclusions, but we need to realize that any good oil company has got to set aside some money for exploration. The challenge is to make sure that the decision to explore is not taken for non-commercial reasons. In 2021, we cannot afford to be exploring in areas where there is just a remote possibility of... Yeah, we need to have something that is guided by technology and by sound scientific knowledge. And if the oil is found in those areas, fine. The truth is that it takes such a long time for you to go from exploration to getting the oil out of gr the ground commercially. So it just depends on how you look at all, all, all of this. There's a lot of emotion in this area, but if you clear out the emotion and you look and you say, well, what can I do in this area and what practically is feasible, then you can see that there are ways around. And that is why I say we have a bill. We can run with it. We can work with it. That is my position. Okay. With regard to <laughs> yeah. what she explained now, I think there is the general misconception that when it comes to the issue of frontier, mm -hmm. it is based in the north. Mm -hmm. No, it is not only, we have the Anambra Basin, mm -hmm. we have the Dahomey Basin, mm -hmm. which is in Lagos, mm -hmm. we have the Calabar Basin. Mm -hmm. Even in the Niger Delta itself, there are areas that are still need to be explored, es es explored for oil. So the 30% profit oil that the National Assembly has designated 
for the purpose of uh, frontier exploration, which is about $375 million per annum. It's not only going to be domiciled in frontiers in the north, but we have frontiers in the south, the Anambra Basin, the Dahomey Basin, the Calabar Basin, and even areas in the Niger Delta that, were, that, that are not yet es explored. So it's not going to be concentrated in the north. It is going to be in, across the nooks and crannies of, of, the, of the country. I, I would imagine uh, that if the bill seeks to commercialize the NNPC, yeah. exploration being significant to uh, any oil corporation, that would be a commercial decision by a commercial enterprise. Mm -hmm. So why has the National Assembly sought now through the bill to indicate a fixed percentage so that it becomes obligatory even on that commercial enterprise? Assuming, assuming it doesn't make commercial sense on the basis of uh, current exigencies and so on and so forth to explain that much, uh, that would be an infraction of the law. So I'll give you time to think about this while we go on this short break and then you respond. Okay. All right, you're welcome back, and uh, we're still live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority discussing the passage by the two chambers of the National Assembly of the uh, Petroleum Industry Bill. Professor Yinka Morobo is still here with us, along, of course, with uh, Honorable Tahi Monguno, who is the Chief Whip of the House of Representatives. Both of them, of course, former attorneys general of their respective states, one Edo, the other Borno. So I, I uh, posed the question before we went on that short break, Honorable uh, Monguno, with regard to why, and just to recast it uh, in, in, in brief, uh, why the bill seeks to create a commercial entity called an NPC, and therefore you expect to take commercial decisions, and at the same time, uh, the bill stipulates 30% of its profit for investment in uh, frontier basin exploration? Well, exploration of oil in any jurisdiction all over the world is not a commercial decision. It's a public decision that is supposed to be driven by the state. Mm -mm. Supposed to be driven by the state for the purpose of the exploration of oil. And it is only the state oil company, that is, in, in our present case, the uh, NNPC, will be charged with the responsibility for the exploration of oil. Because most of these companies, on their own, they will not go and invest huge sums of money for the purpose of exploration. So that is why NNPC Limited is charged with the responsibility of exploration for, for oil, as opposed to allowing uh, other companies uh, or, or international oil companies to come and do. Most of them will not do it. It is left for uh, the state to drive it. And that is why NNPC is mandated to invest 30% of its profit oil for the purpose of our exploration for, for oil. Professor Yenka um, Respectfully, Honorable, I don't agree. The commercial, it, it has to be a commercial decision. Otherwise, it's the same. It's tantamount to pouring your money down a hole into a drain. If there's no commercial um, um, reason for doing it, it's really better not to do it, especially when you don't have money. You, first of all, have to make sure that there's a technical reason to go somewhere. You really can't just go somewhere because you are ordered by a public official to go and explore. It takes so much money. We're talking about several million dollars. So there must be a technical reason to believe that there should be oil in this particular place. Now, the only way you can be sure for certain that there is oil in a particular place is to drill and to explore. But there should be technical reasons, first of all, to ensure that there is oil there. Mm -hmm. And before that oil is developed, everywhere in the world, commercial considerations come into play. There are so many wells that are shot in because the commercial considerations are not right. And if the oil price goes up, those wells will be opened up again. There are so many means of oil extraction 
that are not utilized when there are low prices. So you can't take away commercial. The company will be dead on arrival if it goes as a state decision to go and explore. So you have got to have technical and commercial decisions driving a decision to go to a particular place to explore. That's definite. The NNPC Limited won't even last a minute if it has to throw 30% into a place where all the considerations say there is no oil. There has to be. There, ha there simply has to be. So I think we need to realize that. In fact, when you're talking about 30% of profit, in the first place, there has to be profit. So if there's no profit, it's 30% of zero. So once you create an NPC limited and make it a loss-making institution, you have zero for exploration anywhere. And we don't really want that. So I think that's why it's important. It's mm. I think, yeah. I think uh, when I say commercial decision, uh -huh. I'm not talking strict sensor in the sense of Naira and Kobo. Mm. I'm talking in the sense of the NNPC to go and explore for oil in an area where all the technical indices has shown that there is proven oil reserve. For any, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that NNPC should just uh, be looking for running for oil helter skelter everywhere. No, it is only where all the indices and then the, 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 uh, the commercial decisions are pointed to the fact that there is significant mm -hmm. discovery of oil for NNPC to go and explore. That is what I'm talking about. I'm not still talking uh, strict sense about in the sense of Nera and Kobo for NNPC to go to run, start running health skater and then looking for oil e everywhere, even where there is no significant discovery of oil. There has to be significant discovery I, of I, oil. I but such decisions all over the world, in all jurisdictions, is normally done by the state oil company. Mm. I, I just, I'm just wondering, uh, Honorable Monguno, uh, again, I, I mean, I would admit that I haven't read in detail mm -hmm. the uh, two versions passed. Once the full bill comes out, there's mm -hmm. some 300 or something uh, clauses. Of course, one will, have the, yeah, one will have the benefit of, of, of reading them, mm -hmm. and of when the president also passes. Uh, when, when it is said that 30% uh, of um, uh, Profit oil will be utilized for, for investment. How futuristic is the bill in, in, in entirety? Uh, yes, again, there are dire uh, prognoses regard to how long more the uh, oil economy would last. Uh, some say 20 years, some say 30. We know that it will still be around, you know, for a while. So is, is the focus necessarily to say that an NPC, whatever, whatever, whether limited LNPC, PLC, uh, if, it is, if his hands are tied now by this legislation that has taken 20 years to, to pass, we'll be focusing only on frontier based exploration. What happens? Do, do we expect the NNPC, for instance, to say, look, uh, renewables could also be part of, of our investment outlook? Yes. Uh, the, the NNPC, uh, as, 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 as a limited liability company, and have regard to the fact that the world is going renewables, the NNPC has the option of taking that decision because it is a fully uh, an entity of its own that is not guided by decisions of, uh, of uh, government but purely its own decision of, of its own shareholders it has the option of going investing in in in, 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 renew in renewables because this is purely a commercial decision in tandem with the objective realities of this uh, that is prevalent at that given point in time Mm. In the, uh, um, actually, NNPC yeah. has a renewables division, has had one for quite some time, and um, it's expected that with everything happening in the world, that division will grow. But I think the flaw of the bill is that it really has not addressed anything to do with energy transitions or an energy mix. But as some people have said, its name is Petroleum Industry <laughs> Bill. <laughs> yes. His name so is I Petroleum. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe it should have been Energy <laughs> Industry Bill. <laughs> yeah. so if, if in time it is possible to make money from this prospect in the frontier basins, how will it significantly translate into national development? 
At this point in time, it needs a lot of strategic thinking because, like I say, we're at a point where the Western world and the IEA is talking about moving away from carbon, a carbon economy. The um, period during COVID showed what happens in the world when there's less movement and when there are less emissions. Yeah. And so this sort of galvanized a definite move. And there have been so many things happening in the climate change scene. Mm -hmm. So it's apparent that there has to be a definite move. It's a move being driven by the West. And generally speaking, the West has the money and the West has the technology. So it is an inexorable movement. There is a movement there and we have to be a part of it. So what it means is that uh, every country has to strategically think of what to do with its oil resources, develop the resources, ensure that whatever resources it has are being used for the sustainable development of its citizens. Currently, we have in Nigeria with a horrible energy um, electricity industry about the worst in the world. I actually don't know any worse if it's, uh, I don't know any worse than, than um, us. <coughs> we have half the people without electricity outside the grid. We have the resources. We have natural gas. We have so much that we can use. We have it's so, it's so much. that we're a gas nation. We're, we? we're a gas nation. But again, gas won't go to poor communities easily because they can't pay. So you do need renewables. So there has to be a lot of discussion on the energy mix. It's actually very, very um, essential. So to go back to what you're saying, there isn't too much time. I mean, it's good to have great discoveries. We'll now have to think about how to strategically utilize the discoveries. And I would say that one of the things we'd have to be thinking about is utilizing the discoveries domestically. Mm. Domestically, uh, while at the same time doing a lot of things to offset the carbon that is being emitted as a result of our use of our existing hydrocarbons. Uh, earlier, you, you spoke uh, glowingly uh, of uh, the provisions relating to the gas sector. Uh, you say that right now uh, the bill, of course, has, uh, shall we say, extensive provisions on gas. Mm -hmm. uh, how uh, do these uh, strengthen or diverge from pre-existing uh, frameworks such as the gas master plan and the gas decade? So what change is likely to happen uh, with regard to gas exploration, gas mm -hmm. utilization, uh, the entire gas industry in the country, from what okay. you know. Yeah. Well, let me first say that um, sometimes in Nigeria we forget that investors are very hard-nosed people and there are certain things they look at. So we can say the gas, you know, we can use sloga, slogans and propaganda and say, oh, the gas decade. Fine. Somebody comes, the gas investor comes and looks at the drawing on the wall, looks at this country, <laughs> how risk, what are the risk ratings of this country? What does the country keep to what it says? Does it keep to its various um, agreements, then what are the laws in this area? Right now, it will look and see very, very little. You have a gas master plan. It's not law. Law is always needed to give the structure and directive. When you have a plan, anybody can change it. When you have a policy, anybody can change it. When you have a law, it's, it's something that an investor can hold on to and sue you if need be, if you infringe the provisions. So in having laws to regulate gas, we've created a framework that in, an investor can use to analyze and make a sound investment decision. And that's great. And it has helped all the different very laudable gas uh, objectives under the present Minister of um, State Petroleum. Indeed. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, uh, we, it, uh, in the bill we have what we call the mis uh, uh, Midstream Infrastructure mm -hmm. Fund. Uh, you know, gas is a very capital-intensive investment that uh, needs a lot of resources. As a result of that, the bill created the Midstream mid, uh, mid Infrastructure Fund for the purpose of uh, investment, unlocking our gas potential so that well, we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot use potential unless it is translated into actual use. So the mid, uh, midstream infrastructure uh, fund intends to invest heavily in the gas sector by way of uh, all the fives that is going to be laid, all the fives that is going to be laid mm -hmm. to run across the nooks and crannies of the country for the purpose of uh, 
delivery of oil to Nigerians. So this is one uh, provision that seeks to unlock our gas uh, potential so that it can be brought to the doorsteps of uh, Nigerians for, for their benefit by creating the midstream infrastructure fund, which is purely devoted for the purpose of uh, developing our gas infrastructure. Okay, the bill has been passed, waiting for assent by Mr. President, harmonization. Like the prof said, implementation is key. Well, definitely implementation is key because laws that are just enacted that are not implemented as, as good as no laws at all. So since there is the determination, the zeal, and then enthusiasm on the part of the executive arm of government that up initio brought this bill as an executive bill to the assembly. And then having regard to the fact that uh, there is a need for Nigeria to bring its oil and gas industry, its operations in tandem with international best practice, its, its governance structure, its physical terms to make the Nigeria an investment of destination when it comes to oil and gas industry, to make it much more competitive compared its peers to its peers in other jurisdictions. Because oil is now found everywhere. <coughs> Even in my, my neighbor, my neighbor near Borno said Niger, they have oil, Chad, they have oil, Ghana, they have oil. So there is a need for every jurisdiction to make, to make its oil and gas industry much more competitive and much more attractive. And that is what is embedded in the petroleum industry bill. So because of that, I, the executive having assented, having brought that, this bill as an executive bill and having assented to it will have the political will to implement it to the latter so that Nigerians would get the benefit of having an industry whose operation is in tandem with international best practice and then attract the much needed uh, investors and make it much more competitive. Okay, but Professor Yinka Morabwe, I don't know, but to what extent does the, the bill address environmental issues, in particular environmental regulation? I know that in recent years, We've had a confusion uh, over DPRO, Nostria, Nestria, and, and pollution matters. So uh, what do we know now about, you know, getting uh, to the root of pollution issues and ensuring that there's remediation rather than waiting for uh, some super agency uh, like we're having with Hyperep, you know, going along? Well, first of all, I, I'd have to first start off with the words of uh, one of the major consultants to the bill, who's, who again emphasized the fact that the bill is dealing with petroleum and not with the environment. The environment is a whole big issue that we have to deal with. So the bill does not provide solutions in that area. We have to deal with environment holistically. Had it dealt more with the environment that it presently does, we probably would have dealt with some things that have to do with the energy transmission uh, transition because Clearly, um, environmental damage is, is, is a very terrible factor and it's a big issue that we have. So we actually still have to do something comprehensive on the Nigerian environment to ensure that it is protected. So that is still legislative work that should be in the making. Yes, well, well, the bill has also clearly stated unambiguously that when it comes to environmental matters at it, at it concerns exploration and exploitation of oil, it is going to be governed strictly censored by the environmental laws that we have presently, like the Nazaria Act and what they are going to be governed by that stricter censor. Okay, <laughs> Honorable Taihiro Mongono, um, 
Chairman Article Committee on Petroleum Industry Bill and House of Reps in the House of Reps and Chief Whip of the House of Representatives. It's been a pleasure having you to shed more light on the PRB bill. I know it's still on the front burner to the conversation will continue. Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Professor Yinka Morebe, Research Professor, Nigeria Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and President, Nigeria Association of Energy Economics. Thank you so much for your input. It's been a pleasure having you on Good Morning Nigeria today. Thank you very much. Well, foreign news is next. Haitian President Jovenel Moise was reported to have been shot dead by unidentified attackers in his private residence overnight in a barbaric act. This has brought about fears of escalating turmoil in the impoverished Caribbean nation. The assassination has been condemned by the United States and neighboring Latin American countries, coinciding with a spate of gang violence in Puerto France in recent months, fueled by a growing humanitarian crisis and political unrest. The disorder has turned many districts of the capital into a no-go zone. Interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph said in televised remarks after chairing a cabinet meeting that the government had declared a state of emergency amid confusion over who would take over the reins of the country while urging the people to remain calm as the situation is under control. The 53-year-old wife of the president, Martina Moise, who was shot in the attack at around 1 a.m. at the couple's home in the hills above port france is receiving medical treatment. The interim prime minister said a group of unidentified individuals, some of them speaking Spanish, attacked the private residence of the president of the republic and thus, as it is, the prime minister has urged the United Nations to hold a Security Council meeting on the Caribbean nation's situation as soon as possible following the president's assassination. Nation. He called on the international community to launch an investigation into the assassination. The U.S. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, while condemning the attack, called for those responsible to be brought to justice while calling on Haitians to preserve the constitutional order, remain united in the face of the abhorrent act, and reject all violence as the United Nations will continue to stand with the government and the people of Haiti. Thank you very much, Oyemi Ajayi, for that uh, foreign report. Of course, there will be further developments on the situation in Haiti, and then we'll, of course, take that in our subsequent bulletin. So that's it for us on Good Morning Nigeria today. We well, thank you for tuning in. Remember to, again, join us tomorrow, same time, 7 in the morning. Until then, do take care of yourself. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. And I am Jumwa Yusuf. Do have a wonderful day. Goodbye.